Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us. Our next speaker is Patrick McFadden with Datastax. Please give him a warm welcome. Is this thing on? <laughs> All right, good. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Fratch McFadden. I run developer relations at Datastax. Don't let that bother you. I'm also an engineer, a real one. Um, I've been working with Apache Cassandra for almost eight years, so I've seen it in its darkest days. But let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you about probably one of the most exciting things about Cassandra now that it's 10 years old, is that this is the only database that can do what you probably want it to do. And I'm gonna, I got 20 minutes to convince you. All right, I'm going to start the clock. You better start the clock, guys, or I'm going to keep talking. All right, so this is the common problem that I've run into over the years is somebody from on high says, we're going to the cloud, right? And everybody's like, why are we doing this? Or better yet, you have some team who builds a product and says, oh, we're only going to put that on the cloud. So now you have this problem. You probably spent millions of dollars on your infrastructure, and you have these great data centers, and you've planned out all your floor space, and all your Cat5 cable looks beautiful, and then you're going to the cloud. So now you have this dual problem. What are you going to do about that? Well, why are you doing it is the first question. Now, this was a, I mean, I can't even tell you how long ago I heard this. We're going to burst to the cloud, OK? That was really difficult with an Oracle database, because your Oracle database did not replicate and burst. The only thing that burst was your wallet because you were paying so much to get it to scale. But then whenever you're bursting to the cloud, this is actually in a data center in Northern Virginia, by the way. Um, that means that whenever you have ex increased workloads, that you're moving them to the cloud. This is a perfectly good reason to use the cloud. Here's another one. You're completely extending everything that you have you have your legacy, legacy applications, probably running on Windows, running in your, in your on-prem. But you start building new applications in the cloud. Uh, for instance, mobile applications, modern applications, that sort of thing. So now you're stuck with this new problem. You just built a silo. You have your data center data, and you have your cloud data. And now your DBAs are ready to find a place to stick you and probably bury you in it, because now they have to manage two different things. And that's not very good for them. Now, this is probably what we're hearing more of lately, is people just packing up and moving to the cloud. And moving to the cloud now is not so crazy. Five years ago, people said, I'm all in on cloud, and they were probably a startup. Now, Fortune 500 companies are doing this perfectly fine. But how do you move all of that data to, the, to any place, really, without having downtime, without disrupting your customers, without making them angry at you? Because let's face it, when customers are angry at you, they don't want to give you money. And that's probably why we're in business, right? So Cassandra, Apache Cassandra, a database that I love, and I'm sure everyone else here does too. But if you don't, let me explain why you probably would love Cassandra. Cassandra is an application-based database. It is built to, for keeping applications online, scaling them, doing great things like running in multiple, uh, multiple data centers, potentially even more than one cloud if you wanted to. But it does that really well. It replicates, scales, has high performance. The most important thing is that green light on your application, that should always be on. I know users of, of Cassandra that have had their cloud or had their clusters online for years. They've never had any downtime. And that is pretty magical when it happens. And the best part about this as an old ops person is that it, it's the database that won't wake you up at 3 AM. Nodes can go offline. You wake up, you find out they're offline. No problem. We can make this work. So when I need more Cassandra, this is what I love about it. I just add more nodes. Sorry, PowerPoint has terrible transitions. I love Keno better. But anyway, um, when I need more Cassandra, I just add more nodes. And it's done online. Now, this is a single data center application. But looking at this, I'm thinking, well, what about in a multi-data center situation? No problem. This is the only database that does this is run in more than one data center, active-active. Now, you can probably, wait a minute, there's other databases that do this. No, there isn't. 
there were some other open source databases that were coming up at the same time Cassandra has, came up, but they just haven't caught as much traction. Cassandra kind of pulled out ahead, and it's the database that works. And how it works is really important, but this multi-data center thing has been a really big deal for a lot of big companies. For instance, Netflix has this wonderful talk about how they run in multiple data centers. Your data is all around the world active-active. And that's pretty awesome, because whenever I travel from San Francisco to London, I can pick up you know, my daredevil habit right there. I don't have to go back and be like, oh, I hope they sync my data sometime. No, as soon as it finish, I finish a, a show and it updates the database, since it's in Cassandra, it's in the other data center in, within milliseconds. And that's pretty awesome. But even more awesome is this problem. When things start going bad, and let's face it, has anyone had a data center stay online for 100% of the time? Yeah, I guess that kind of happens, but probably not, right? Everything breaks. It's the universe that we live in. Things break. A, a node goes offline, you should still have a green light on your application. A whole entire data center goes offline, you should still have a green light on your application. What if a whole cloud goes offline? That happens. Not very often, but it happens. Everything has a fail rate. You just have to plan for it. You have 0% chance of 100% uptime if you're in one data center. That's it. You're never going to get 100% uptime, or even close to it, if you're in one data center. This is why banks love Cassandra. This is why retail companies love Cassandra, because of that green light up there. Because you know what happened on Cyber Monday? What was that, just three days ago? All of the apps that I know that run Cassandra on my phone were online the whole day. Not one of them went offline. And they're pretty happy, and why? Because they are making money. So ironically enough, Cassandra does have these strong roots in computer science. And I'm, and I'm just giving you this primer, I'm not gonna dig into it too much. The irony part is this is actually a, a, a white paper from Amazon called the Dynamo paper. That's what it's based on. The Dynamo paper was built around this idea, you know, like how do we build a database that scales, stays online, and can work in multiple data centers globally across the WAN. So how does Cassandra replicate? I'm going to do it very simply here. Um, but essentially what it is is each node is independent. It's a masterless architecture, shared nothing. But each node is responsible for a certain range of data. And every node um, after it stores part of that data set. It's called a replica. Now, that replication factor is something you specify in, when you build your cluster. You can change it on the fly, online. But whenever one node doesn't hold, only, uh, doesn't hold all of the data for that one node, it's also shared, one node can go offline, and the other nodes will pick up the slack. And it's not a failover. It's just simply how the requests go to the, uh, to the cluster. Now, the other thing that's really interesting about this is that consistency level is something you control as a developer. Consistency level is a very important part of how you build an application. And that consistency level is, I need to know what data went to the disk. Not in memory, it has to be committed to disk. And you could choose every single replica has to show that it went to disk. I want a quorum, 51%, or just one of them. That's it. So that, that's kind of the nutshell version of how it replicates. But I will tell you, there's a lot more to go, and I'll show you how to get more information about that later. So I work at Datastax. We have this thing called Datastax Enterprise. What we do is we add this thing, we add some stuff to Cassandra that makes it a lot more useful for cloud development, such as search. We have a graph database that sits on top of Cassandra. We have analytics running with Spark, and of course, a ton of security, because let's face it, you can't do anything anymore without a ton of security, because everybody wants to break into your database. And they do. So let me talk about how we're getting into the network. Now, of course, this discussion was not only about Cassandra, but also how a network configuration can make your life better when you're talking about hybrid cloud. Now, when we talk about relying on the public internet, I think this is another problem I, I hear, especially around security, is if I'm going from my on-prem database or data center to Amazon, I have to go over the public internet. That means I have to manage my firewall, got some VPN problems, there's routes in between there. There is a lot of potential issues that can happen. And let's face it, network is never reliable. Do you remember the eight fallacies of distributed computing? 
uh, the network is reliable was one of them. It's never reliable. So this is a problem that we all have to deal with whenever we're dealing with anything that's distributed is the network in between has to be maintained. So AWS Direct Connect, um, this is part of what I'm talking about today. This is something our customers use. And what AWS Direct Connect does is allow you to create from a physical data center to Amazon a pipe that's dedicated for your bit traffic. So whenever you have traffic going from one place to another, you want to try to get the best path possible. Let me explain how it works. So part of what Direct Connect does is it connects to, there's a bunch of providers, like Equinix is one of them, uh, CoreSight, uh, there's a huge list of providers. So if you're, if you're renting space from one of these providers, I didn't even know this until I really started digging into Direct Connect. There's a lot of providers worldwide that will give you a pipe directly into Amazon. So you're not creating a, a public internet connection. You're not having to route it over public IP. You can actually get your own dedicated line to Amazon's data center. Now, if you're running this hybrid setup where you have your on-prem and your cloud setup, you, having this gives you the guarantees for a lot of things. Like, for instance, your bandwidth costs. If you're going to get, if you're going to buy bandwidth, I used to run infrastructure for a long time. Buying bandwidth was, that was half of the cost. The other half was uh, how much power, or really it's cooling, you had in your data center. Now, with bandwidth, it can be variable, right? What if you have a, you're using a ton of bandwidth, and all of a sudden you get that surprise bill? Well, predictability is an important thing. <laughs> and whenever you're using Amazon Direct Connect, then you can get that dedicated uh, bandwidth without having to pay for the variability of it. So this is one of the interesting things about it, is you buy it in tiers. You can buy a one gig tier, a 10 gig tier, or you can mix and match those together, say a 10 and a one, so you get 11 gigs. And that bandwidth is add additive. You can add bandwidth to this. Now, why this is important, if you're replicating data from one large data, uh, data center to another data center, having that dedicated bandwidth is really critical. And having multi-gigabits of data that's all yours and you're not fighting for every little last bit of traffic as it goes over the public internet is going to be really advantageous especially if you're going to be in hybrid cloud mode for a long time. I, you know, I talk to a lot of people, they're like, yeah, we're going to be shutting down our data center someday. Right, when someday? Probably after I retire, right? How many of you still have a mainframe somewhere in your environment, you know? Yeah, exactly. So, all right. So this dedicated bandwidth tiers is really handy for you to like, do predictive and get it set up. So really, you're just, what you're doing is you're just setting up these pipes in between. So you can also separate your traffic. You can separate traffic from your on-prem data center into the public AWS services, such as S3, that sort of thing. You saw a lot of those this morning. Also into your VPC. Now we do recommend setting up clusters inside of a VPN or a VPC. So having that direct access into VPC is really critical because this is your data. And you know what criminals want mostly? is your data. They don't want your application code. They want your data. They want what users are doing on your site. And so setting up a VPC, having a dedicated connection into that VPC, really critical. The underlying technology here is MPLS, which is the multi-protocol layer system. And so MPLS, and this is super basic primer, but essentially what on the left is how you would do it if you were routing public IP traffic. The IP, it uses an IP address, which then gets routed from node to node, like through different routers, and it can take different paths, et cetera. That's using TCP IP. That's it. That's what you get whenever you use a public internet. Whenever you use MPLS, what you're doing is you're basically creating a tunnel from one data center to the other that's protocol independent. So you can use things like Ethernet or Sonnet, ATM. You can even, I even looked this up. You can use Token Ring if you wanted to. And sadly, I think some of you may be like, awesome, we could use that, right? <laughs> um, but please don't. <laughs> but what it does, it, because now it's protocol independent, and you have more control of your network traffic, and that gives you that layer that you need. You're talking about data. You're moving data from one place to another. You want to have that level of control. So 
wrapping up here because I only get 20 minutes to talk and that's not enough for me if you know me. Um, you get, how are you gonna do this? Let's get into the actual house. This is the best part about Cassandra is that it is a very simple system at its core. Yes, it's complicated because it's a distributed system, but at its, at its heart, it's made to do what it's supposed to do, which is like doing multi-data center. So if I, here's the example. I have a, my cluster, just one data center set up. It's running in my on-prem data center, probably at Equinix somewhere in Northern Virginia, more than likely. Um, and I set up my AWS Direct Connect into Amazon. All right, so now I have a pipe. What do I do next? The first step is to create a cluster, or to extend your cluster using the alter key space. Now, this is actually a command that you would type into the command line for the key space. Key space is a container of tables. Key space contains the information about how the data is replicated anywhere. What I did is I added a line down here that AWS 3. What that says is I want three copies of my data in my Amazon data center. I'm also in data center one, I'm going to have three copies there. So now I have three copies here, three copies there. I've essentially just set up a multi data center configuration with this key space. And this is the setup that I'm going to do. Now I'm going to actually get the nodes going. So now I'm going to provision my new nodes. But when I bring those up, and this is a very important thing, I'm going to tell them not to bootstrap any data just yet. I'm going to just bring up the nodes. I want to see them online. So I'm going to add these up. So I'm going to create a, another cluster, or I'm sorry, another cluster. This is one cluster. I'm going to create another data center's worth of, of nodes, same size as the other. There we go. Come on. So now I have, this is one cluster. However, I have two sets of nodes, and one in one data center and one in Amazon. And so these nodes over here are currently not provisioned. Okay, So they don't have any data going to them. So how I get that data to move once I verify that everything is working, I run a node tool rebuild command on one of these nodes, and all that data starts moving over. And this is how I, all right, this is how I verify that I have the servers running. I do a node tool rebuild. It synchronizes the data back over. Once it's finished, and it, based on how much bandwidth you provide, because that's how fast it'll go, these nodes will be online. Now, this is a very fast overview, because I have 20 minutes, but this is where you start bringing your application over as well. There's a lot of application considerations whenever you have it running in multiple data centers. At DataStax, we do this all the time, and we love to help you. This is part of what DataStax does, is we cheer you from the sidelines, and we support you, and we help you be successful building applications that run just like this. Now, for some reason, Equinix has a power outage, my Amazon data center is going to be online. I always have my data. It'll always be ready. So now I have my application running. I have it in two places. Everybody's happy. How do I going to do This is going to be something that you can learn how to do. I'm doing a shameless plug for a course that we have. This is a free class that you can take. Uh, this is um, on our Academy website. This is a, the long form, of course. This is the more than 20 minute version. But this is how you're going to learn how to do these kind of operations. You'll learn how to run a cluster, how to do things like run it across multiple data centers. I can run it not only in those two data centers, I can run it in three or four data centers. I can even run it in any cloud I wanted to. We don't care where you run your data. We really just want to make sure that you have a running database that works well for your application. Where you run it is up to you, and we will help you do that. So that's it. I'm just at the time. Thank you very much. And if you'd like more information, and more importantly, a t-shirt, come to Boost 3008. <laughs>